Ah, welcome to the second day. Welcome, Leah. Thank you so much. It's over to you. Uh, thank you, everyone. We are very lucky to be joining uh, the conference. Uh, uh, my name is uh, Lea Vene. Uh, I'm a researcher at CIMO, uh, Center for Fashion and Clothing uh, Research, based uh, in Zagreb, uh, Croatia. Um, dobro jutro, dobrodošli uh, na konferenciju uh, Global Fashion Assembly. Moje ime je Lea Vene. Uh, ja vam se ovdje u ime CIMA. We've discussed it. It would be nice to say hello in both of the languages. Um, the way that we structure the conference is that um, I will give you a little bit of an intro of how we planned uh, the session, uh, the speakers that uh, we decided to host, uh, and uh, then we'll just go on with, with the program. Uh, I will uh, share my screen and... Um, if I could just uh, get the possibility to share the screen. Um, Perfect. I hope you can see my screen. Um, he did, but you were fast asleep. You, you were like this. And someone uh, is uh, not muted, so we can say bye, Nala, but he will call you on your phone. <laughs> if you okay. can mute yourself. Um, um, so, uh, on behalf of uh, Timo for the Global Fashion Assembly, we were discussing what would make sense to uh, kind of a curate uh, as our panel that would uh, kind of a portray the best what we are currently doing and some of our uh, projects, but also connect to what we did before. So, Timo was uh, started back in 2013 as a non-profit and non-governmental um, uh, organization. And uh, since then, we've been doing various kinds of projects of trying to rediscover local fashion history, kind of a focusing on um, inter interrelation between what's happening on the local level of the Balkans, of the context of the Eastern Europe, but also in relation to, uh, let's say, global fashion practices. Um, and in that sense, something that we've been uh, researching from the very beginning was the uh, the history and the representation of the workers' culture, uh, whether it's uh, in the media uh, or uh, in various kinds of visual arts, uh, but also how it's, uh, uh, let's say, how it's been uh, present in the productive center in the industry. So uh, following this interest, we decided to form this panel that we called Rereading uh, Workwear Clothing Practices. And uh, we will try to connect uh, some researchers, uh, artists, curators that have been tackling this topic, that have been our collaborators from the very beginning, uh, to kind of uh, bring this topic uh, closer to you. Um, the speakers that uh, we've invited uh, today uh, are Chiara Bonfiglioli. She's a lecturer and a researcher. Um, uh, she was specialized uh, in uh, uh, her postdoctor research here in Croatia, uh, focused on the decline of the textile sector in the Balkans. So she will give us a little bit of a insight into that, specifically focusing on the female workers and how this is affected uh, on the, in the context of the gender. Then we've invited uh, Maya Getic, uh, a professor uh, at the Faculty of um, uh, craft, uh, arts and crafts uh, in, and textile design in Belgrade, but she's also an artist. Uh, three years ago, we collaborated with her on a project that we showed as an exhibition here in Zagreb. So she will speak about her own practice that relates to the textile uh, histories, uh, specifically, uh, again, oriented towards the local textile mm -hmm. sector. Uh, then we've invited also Maya Archebic. Uh, she's a um, curator at the City Museum Zagreb. Uh, where um, she is working on uh, collecting uh, various kinds of elements of workwear related to the local uh, industry sector. And uh, we've been discussing with her a lot of what does it mean and how to collect workwear, what does it mean for the local uh, industrial sector and uh, industrial history. So she will be speaking a little bit about this. And uh, finally, we've invited uh, Ben Kane and Tina Gverovic, um, uh, a, a artistic duo. Uh, ben is um, from UK and Tina is Croatian. And this year we are working with them. They're producing a project that's uh, reflecting uh, some of the workwear uh, garments that are part of the Zagreb City Museum collection. But they've been generally revisiting um, what does it mean um, this workwear in today's practice? How do we relate it to the fashion system? And what kind of a meaning uh, or 
uh, acronology does it there. Uh, also, we will, um, in between the speakers, we will, um, I will jump in with a short film uh, by Bruna Jakupovic, a young artist, uh, currently student at the new media department. Last year with her, we also produced a film related to uh, her grandmother's story about the experience of working uh, in one of the textile industries here in Zagreb. Um, <clears throat> Uh, for this uh, introduction, uh, I wanted to give you a little bit of an intro. What is our, uh, let's say, what is our position as a center? What kind of a topics we're interested in? And I wanted to give just a brief uh, basic intro so all of the other speakers could kind of uh, fill in and uh, bring the story um, more up front. So um, as I said before, um, the way that we kind of started off as Timo was to uh, rethink uh, this kind of a relation in between the dominant fashion center and these other fashion peripheries. Uh, what kind of a stories, what kind of a histories lie in the fashion peripheries? Uh, in, in, in order to kind of uh, also decentralize this discourse around what is contemporary fashion, what is the fashion history, and how certain invisible or let's say so many times also silent stories can also come out. Um, also kind of uh, to rethink and redistribute the idea of uh, what are the hierarchies and how can we resist and uh, in a way also transform them by telling some local stories by telling them first uh, first of all in the local language because uh, what we've noticed that is that that we are definitely missing these local uh, written histories uh, in creation there's been very little pr produced uh, very little textbooks uh, so we realized there's definitely uh, an area where we have to also jump in and start doing this research but also to publish this research in english because there's very limited uh, materials related to let's say what is an eastern european um, fashion or how can we discuss it a lot of these materials also come from the center not exactly from where uh, these um, case studies maybe lie so we also realize this is where we have to uh, work um, I guess also uh, thinking about some of the starting points of the Global Fashioning Assembly, some interest around also thinking uh, beyond uh, Eurocentric point of view. So even though uh, Croatia is definitely part of the European Union, we are very much on the periphery. Our position is on the borders. And I guess with this position, we have a very interesting point of view where we are able to see what happens in the center, but by not con like exactly belonging to the center, we're also able to reflect and to see also the digested elements of the fashion system coming to the periphery and in, and in which way they are coming to life. Um, also this position of European but not quite European on so many levels is also a point of view that I think could be very fruitful for the research that, that we want to do. One uh, key concept that for us was quite relevant and I think was very um, interesting to, to bring into our research was the concept of self-colonization, something that we see very common in this part uh, of Europe, where we are kind of a very eager to uh, mimic, to replicate some of the models that we see within the uh, European centers or centers in the West. Uh, I guess we try to take this as, as a strategy that uh, we cannot avoid, but also to critically reflect on it. So it's, um, it's an important part of our research to see how this aspect of, of self-colonization uh, is present. And something that I think um, re, uh, is a um, base for, for the research that we're doing, and um, it's related to the political, social, and economical history of, uh, of Eastern Europe, especially uh, now I have to refer to the, uh, to the space of uh, former Yugoslavia, is this kind of a history of non-aligned movement. Certain elements of this, um, of this um, political gestures and, and the ethos present in the non-aligned movement is something that we see today uh, as part of uh, decolonial practices. And I think uh, growing up or like having this legacy is definitely something that helps us rethink what kind of uh, strategies uh, we can reuse or rethink in, in today's uh, um, curatorial research work. Um, one important um, thing that is also a starting point for the research that we will showcase today is actually rethinking um, uh, anti-fashion. So something that's uh, definitely resisting the fashion system and that is the uniform as, as something that stands outside of any kind of trends or let's say any kind of, uh, um, uh, um, let's say, uh, uh, um, legacies that are put up front maybe uh, through, uh, profession systems or any kind of current trends. So we were also thinking about how this um, 
everyday element of uniform is an important aspect of the research because mm -hmm. uh, within Timo practice, I guess we try to do a lot of work related to where does clothing fit everyday life? How can it represent the everyday life of a city? And uh, discussing the uniform is necessarily discussing the modernization, industrialization, something that was relevant, especially for the very center of Croatia, which is Zagreb as the capital, but also other cities where this industry was the element of modernization of certain uh, places. Um, I guess what comes hand in hand when, when discussing the, the uniform uh, is also dis dis discussing uh, working class heritage, uh, working class histories that of course have been neglected, have been um, less uh, or have been put in a kind of a very negative context, especially in the period of the privatization in the 19th, with big, with big decline uh, of the textile sector. And we will definitely discuss that as well. That has really changed the way that we portray the worker, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the legacy of the worker in the, um, in the contemporary culture. And this is where we kind of try to think uh, how can we reread then this working class or give it a kind of a new visibility, um, kind of a new presence. Um, so what we realized, and also for this uh, specific uh, talk, is to rethink uh, this uh, interrelation between the local textile industry and uh, workwear histories. They are kind of uh, inseparable, and that's what we're trying to do today with this panel, kind of uh, make bridges in between what was happening in textile industry and how it is significant for what we can read from the, from the workwear itself. Um, we will speak a lot about one specific garment, uh, which um, we translated uh, like workwear in a more broader terms, but in a Croatian language, we have a very specific um, name for that, and it's kuta. It's this um, like a work dress uh, that we will come back to in the second part. But I really also want to bring in some of the elements of the local language, which are quite relevant, and that's exactly the word kuta. Um, I guess uh, one important thing that I have to mention is uh, also that uh, we try to work against uh, commodification of workwear, of uh, this workwear becoming like kind of a fetishized object for the fashion system. It's also something I think we will discuss a little bit when um, um, in the last project uh, with uh, Tin, um, Tina and Ben, uh, how can we kind of a juggle uh, having this, this um, uh, this uh, very strong element, uh, very strong link to, to workwear, but not to fetishize it, how to think about uh, this uh, workwear as uh, an alternative to, to fashion system, as something that brings a more a human level to how we portray clothes or how we feel clothes or how it fits the everyday life. Um, I've prepared a very short, a short uh, slideshow that I will go through just as part of the introduction, just to get an idea of the setting that we're, com we're coming from. Uh, the research of, of Timo has uh, begun in 2014 and 15 uh, with the research of early socialism, which is, um, let's say, from 1946 onwards, so after the Second World War, where we were collecting various kinds of visual representation um, uh, of uh, workers. Uh, trying to rethink what is the identity of the worker, how is the ideology and the politics shaping uh, this representation of the worker, specifically in the, um, in the magazines, uh, in, the, um, in the everyday element of culture. So that will be various kinds of uh, printed um, uh, materials where whether it was brochures, where they were selling this um, workwear or whether it was um, daily newspapers. And um, with the few sl slideshows, I wanted to just uh, kind of a contrast. Um, I guess we were also interested in the gender element, female, uh, male uh, uh, workers and the representation. Uh, definitely this kind of um, body appearance, uh, protective wear, uh, typology, stereotypes, social image, text related to uh, this portrayal of the workers. What was the role of the workers uh, from you know, like in the period of the early socialism, where one of these, uh, where most of these uh, images come from. We've also collected images from, from private archives, uh, really trying to capture the everyday life uh, of the workers and, and seeing in which ways these stereotypes actually match, what we're reading, uh, what we're knowing, how can we capture, uh, let's say, um, some kind of oral history still related to that early period, mm -hmm. speaking to uh, former textile workers, speak, speaking to uh, textile owners, let's say managers uh, of, of that time, uh, designers working in a um, specific textile sector to kind of rethink um, how can this, to uh, this uh, story be told? One important elements were different kinds of um, 
labor actions, so actions where uh, youth was mobilized uh, to help a uh, new country grow after the Second World War. So a lot of the interesting materials related to work were also come from this type of materials uh, that, that we've also gathered. Uh, as I mentioned, different types of brochures where workwear becomes an element of really like fully representing the new also textile sector, but also the new growing um, working class as, as the key element of, of this, um, of, the, of the political system itself. Um, there are some specific elements that we will also come back to, like this specific shoe called uh, Borosana, that was definitely also an element that um, marked, it was a kind of a very strong symbol of, um, of a worker, of a female worker, especially working uh, in the service sector. So we've been also trying to capture this um, specific, like almost icons of what is, what is the work where uh, of, of the time. Um, one important element that was uh, also part of this modernization and really strong um, um, uh, means of trying to connect to the world standards of how do we uh, um, structure the textile or any kind of industrial sector, but also specifically the sector of producing um, uh, textile garments is uh, various kinds of, um, uh, let's say, uh, international standards of measuring male and female bodies and um, modernization related to these standards of how they are implemented instantly in the industry where there's already professionals who are understanding the standards and producing garments on the top level. And um, we were, uh, with, the new, with this new project with um, uh, Tina and Ben that will speak at the very end, they were also quite interested in this uh, international standards, these anthropometries and how is this body being treated within the sector, within this uh, textile sector and how could this also be an important element to reflect when discussing workwear or when discussing human bodies in relation to the to the workwear. Um, this is uh, maybe the, a, a brief introduction for the beginning of our uh, panel for our next speaker, Chiara Bonfilioli, and that's uh, discussing the decline of this textile sector from the big rise uh, after the Second World War to the decline in the 80s, especially 90s and 2000s. Uh, uh, it was the time of the of the civil war uh, in the in the Balkans, and it was also a period uh, of uh, privatizations that were kind of, a, in many ways, also intentional to destroy the, the uh, different types of industrial sectors, but among them also the textile sector. There's been a very strong presence of female bodies on the streets, these female stories, um, these, these, these women being uh, generally, um, let's say, de-dignified on so many levels uh, with this, with this de decline. I've, there's, there's plenty of images to choose when you want to portray this. Uh, I thought that these images were, were quite um, compelling also in relation to our research. And this is just one of the protests that was happening in the city center 2014, uh, female workers of DTR, one of the factories located actually um, in Zagreb. Um, a lot of these uh, female bodies in the public space, specifically here we also have this uh, them wearing this, uh, their own workwear to kind of signify their uh, their presence and their belonging in in this quest in this um, uh, in this situation of trying to visualize what was actually happening to the textile sector. Um, uh, both Chiara and Maya uh, Getsic will uh, help us kind of also uncover more these stories and see in which way we could tackle um, these uh, the, the local histories. Uh, and finally, uh, with um, with the research of um, uh, Tina Gvelovic and Ben Cain, uh, I guess we will also try to think um, where is this link in between artistic labor, manual labor? How can the manual labor of the textile worker come in as part of the artistic practice? How to, how can we rethink of different type of types of workforces, um, these different kinds of decelerization uh, as a, as a strategy to kind of um, rethink what can we bring in into this artistic labor? Uh, also being interested uh, as a garment, uh, as a proof of a work rather than an object that has a wearable function. So I think the idea of creative labor, manual labor, and um, kind of bringing in the uniform and the, and the workwear kind of comes in. This is one of the screenshots coming from their work, but uh, I think uh, with their presentation, you'll get a better sense. Mm -hmm. I guess with this, I think I've given enough of an um, of, um, intro. Uh, maybe some things uh, will become more clear as we will go on with the presentation and as we will kind of uh, discover some of these researches in more depth. Um, here, I would like to finish with the introduction and uh, I would like to check if uh, Chiara Mofiliori is uh, here with us. 
because I would like to invite her to um, to start with her presentation. Mm. Hi, Leah. Thank you for inviting me. Hi. I'm going to um, share my screen. Oops. All right. Can you all see the slides? Yeah, it's perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much. So I will start. So uh, thank you for, for the introduction. I think you already gave us some elements to understand the context. And um, today I'm going to talk a bit about textile factories and their current industrial heritage in the post Yugoslav space. And I think that SEMA work is, is really, SEMA work is really uh, important to preserve this heritage. So just to start from this still, this is from the 2015 musical video firma or company by the popular Croatian rock band Hladno Pivo. Uh, and in this video, workers from the industrialized factories take center stage, while the refrain of the song symbolizes the economic and social changes brought by, by post-socialist privatization and deindustrialization. The refrain of the song captures the economic and social changes of the last 30 years in the region, and it uh, goes as follows, God, homeland, nation, all freeze, this is privatization. Free up space for 200 families. The song points at the predominance of conservative ideology under the nationalist regime of Ranjo Tujman, the first um, president of independent Croatia, who had famously announced that 200 families were supposed to take charge of the Croatian economy after the fall of socialism. Another verse of the song recalls how industrial companies collapsed without firing a bullet, namely without any workers' resistance. The video that accompanies the song, however, adds a combative tone to the piece and relies on the static of workers' collective heroism, combativeness, and dignity. While members of the band sing in this uh, workwear or blue collar factory outfits, industrial workers appear in the video as dignified, as dignified subjects, reciting their own narrative in between the song. Notably, there is this Kamenska worker that opens the video, Danica, and she said, um, we were good when we were enlarging the suits of politicians, even better when we sue a new one for them, as they could not fit the old ones. And where are we now? This quote comes from a very real and very metaphorical story of a finance minister who kept bringing his suit to the Kamensko textile workers for them to fix it because it was growing larger and larger, while workers in the meantime were growing thinner and thinner due to their unpaid wages and their subsequent hunger strike that they uh, engaged in in 2010 to reclaim their unpaid wages. As another worker declared during the strike, when we were suing in three shifts for the army during the homeland war, then we were a European fashion house. And when we were suing tailor suits for the first Croatian president, we were also a European fashion house. But now when we ask for unpaid wages, we are only the house of European shame. The industrial heritage of textile factories within, with a predominantly uh, female force is perhaps less visible than the heritage of male-based heavy industry in the region. But nonetheless, it's a very significant one, given that textile factories were one of the main sites of industrial employment for working class women during the socialist period, symbolizing women's emancipation and the modernization of gender relations. Almost every small center in socialist Yugoslavia had its own textile factory. And when doing research for my project, almost every friend or acquaintance in the region uh, had a female relative, a mother, a grandmother, an aunt who used to work in a textile factory. In the process of post-socialist transition, around half a million or let's say uh, 400,000 jobs were lost in the industry, which is now extremely limited in post-Yugoslav states, except for Serbia and North Macedonia. The process of deindustrialization and ruination, which affected textile factories and which resulted in a devaluation of women's industrial employment, has been at the core of different artistic and activist projects in recent years. Most of these initiatives, led by a young generation of activists who came of age after socialism, have been aimed at recovering the lost archives of the industrialized factories and the lost memories of former workers hit by privatization, often their mothers fathers as well, because men were also working in these factories and relatives of the young activists in question. The younger generation are clearly interested in learning more about the social welfare and job security enjoyed by the older generations, which became almost unimaginable and difficult to articulate in contemporary post yugoslav societies. Kinga Posniak has observed similar, similar forms of intergenerational transmission in her ethnography of the post-industrial town of Nova Huta in Poland, where young people revive the legacies of work and community ties in order to cope with increasing precariousness and unemployment. 
such initiatives have also denounced the criminal privatization. That was a term that I kept hearing when I was doing my research. The criminal privatization practice is characteristic of post-socialism, which has been particularly brutal in the former Yugoslavia due to, to the parallel process of economic and social dispossession that happened during the breakup of the country. So you had this moment of extreme upheaval during the war when the workers are also having many difficulties to resist um, the privatization process because they are accused of being national traitors, right? So there are trade unionists that are murdered. There is this very strong pressure to people to conform to the new regimes. And so uh, the resistance against privatization is very difficult at that stage. And so the workers really have this experience of strong dispossession. So um, in this paper, I will discuss some of these cultural and activist interventions in Croatia in order to highlight younger generation attachment to the textile industrial heritage in the region and how such interventions brought forward textile workers' bodies and their protests through artistic performances and installations. I will address three case studies, Kamensko in Zagreb, Arena Tricotage in Pula and Dalmatinka in Sin. And we have to remember that in Croatia, around 100,000 jobs were lost in the sector in the past 30 years, and there is very little production today. So to start, so again, this is the, um, I'll start with the Kamensko. So Kamensko is, um, it has been re receiving a lot of exposure because of this 2010 hung hunger strike. Uh, in, in late socialism, the Kamensko factory employed up to 2,600 workers in its Zagreb plant and is, was exporting mainly to uh, Western Europe. In 1993, the factory was privatized through the shareholder system. And after 2005, when the sale of factory shares to outsiders was permitted, one of the directors started to sell his share on the market. And so construction companies bought most of the shares because this factory building was in the center of the capital in Zagreb. And so um, it was really um, something um, that was seen as uh, profitable for real estate investment. After 2006, the factory started to accumulate losses and as a result of intricate financial speculations um, linked to this uh, tycoon named Miroslav Kutle, the factory went uh, bust. So in 2009, as a result of such privatization, wage payments started to be delayed for the remaining 400 some workers. and um, and so the workers were kind of not sure what to do. Occasional payments will be made to keep workers from going on strike. But in September 2010, after seven months since the last wage was paid, a group of 20 Kamensko workers decided to go on a hunger strike in the park located in front of the factory. Workers organized a strike against the advice of the main union for textile workers, which also warned that uh, this strike would put them at risk of layoffs. And so what they did was to keep working during the day and then um, sitting in the park during the night and uh, not eating. So that was the kind of uh, struggle. And despite the lack of union support, workers received support from civil society activists and students, especially since the real estate speculation linked to Kamensko were seen as connected to the wider right to the city movement. And this movement inspired at least uh, three theater dramas. So these are some of the, some of the uh, theater production that were, coming out of, of this Kamensko. And the, as I mentioned, there was also this Firma video, which on the left bottom uh, shows some of the uh, Kamensko workers. Um, so the, the, these cultural workers that were engaged on, on this production, they were writing most of these uh, pieces, the theater pieces in cooperation with the workers. And, um, and they were kind of connecting the struggle of the workers to to the current struggles in the uh, in the kind of widespread working arena, but also in the in the you know in the area of cultural production. For, so, for instance, in this Unbreakable Threads performance, um, the performance was ad advertised as follows in 2011. They said, "Every dignified life is a work of art." From Homer's Penelope, who defended her own independence and the sheer numbers of suitors by her weaving through Aristophanes Lysistrata, who was a weaver and the first literary pacifist by profession, to the Kamensko textile workers, a dignified life includes the right to work. And we must knowledge of how deeply intertwined our lives are. Ariane Stred led Theseus out of the labyrinth. Kamensko workers with their professionalism are also looking for a solidarity thread to get out of the creation of war profiteers, non-expert and incompetent rulers. So again, this was this kind of overall critique of society that was voiced. 
one positive outcome that is to be mentioned is that uh, some of the workers that um, were laid off, they uh, stuck together and they created this Udruga or NGO that is doing small repairs and, and is suing for the local community. And so they get some um, orders by activist um, groups and they kind of keep this, um, this kind of community alive. And this was done largely to make sure that some of the women who uh, were laid off could reach their uh, retirement age. Okay, let me know if I'm going too much over time. I can also cut a bit. Um, so another case study is uh, the one of Arena Tricotage or Arena Knitwear Factory in Pula. And here I put some of the production because they had this beautiful knitwear uh, fashion. The Arena Knitwear Factory was founded in 47, just after the war. And its production was exported all over the world and it came to employ around 800 workers during socialism. Arena was declared bankrupt in 2014 after several years of mismanagement and indebtedness. And um, there was also some element of speculation there because the factory was just in front of the harbor in Pula and Pula is a touristic town. So there were definitely some ideas about how to convert this building. And the remaining 62 workers had to carry out a three month strike in 2014 to receive the official declaration of bankruptcy because until it wasn't declared bankrupt, they couldn't ask for social welfare. Um, like Kamensko workers, Arena workers started striking out of desperation after they, their wages were not paid for, for um, eight months, right? So beside the workers who lost the jobs, the bankruptcy also it hired the pensioners of Arena because this was um, a, a factory that had an internal bank. So a lot of pensioners, they invested their money in this internal bank and the uh, money disappeared. So this was not an enormous amount for, for Western standard, but for some of these women, it was really their life savings. And so they were, um, they were really desperate. In front of the factory during the strike in February, a former workers in tears testified that she'd been saving for 25 years and that their um, uh, 40,000 kuna or 5,000 euro approximately disappeared without a trace. The value of the saving contained in the bank was about 6 million kuna or around 800,000 euro, so almost like a million. While important amounts gathered from the sale of arena shops were also missing. So there was this kind of big gap in money and the, and the pensioners and the workers, they uh, got the worst of it. And even if the arena strike was less visible in national media than Kamensko, Arena workers gather a considerable amount of local solidarity and media attention, particularly on the 8th of March 2014 demonstration, during which uh, there was a gathering in front of the factory which denounced privatization. And uh, during, this, um, during this demonstration, there was also this catwalk on strike. So that was the poster of the 8th of March, and there was this catwalk on strike. So Modna Revio Strike, they were showcasing the garment. So in the back, you see uh, up the stairs, there are some of the workers wearing the knitwear from the factory. And then um, there is also this, uh, this person on the left is um, activist and singer Anna Jurtsen, and she sang this traditional Italian folk song, La Lega, which says, although we are women, we are not afraid for the love of our children, we join the union, which is a famous um, so, uh, song from Bertolucci, Move in Novecento, and a traditional uh, song of struggle from the female rice growers of the Po Valley in Italy. And after this event, uh, this, this uh, choir, this Bol Praxa, continued as an activist choir that performs around Croatia uh, on 1st of May, 8th of March, and this, um, this moments of uh, collective remembrance of workers' struggle. Um, okay, and the last, the last case study is the, um, the factory Dalmatinka in Sinj. The Dalmatinka was founded in, in 1951. So it was a conservative uh, rural area. And most of the community there was opposing the fact that young women was, were working outside the home, especially the fact that they were doing the night shift was seen as especially um, as very uh, problematic. So people in the villages would talk of the factory as a whorehouse. The night shift in particular caused moral panic. The spinning mill, however, eventually grew to a factory of over 2,000 workers contributing to the development of the local region. Besides its avant-garde facilities, Dalmatinka also sponsored the construction of housing for workers, as the other factories, and of various sport facilities, such as an Olympic swimming pool that is seen as the pride of local inhabitants. During the war, due to the closeness of scene to the front, 
the war, I'm talking the war of the 90s, so the war uh, of the breakup of Yugoslavia. The factory temporarily served as a refuge for the local hospital, including the maternity ward, so that one former worker we met during our visit revealed that she had given birth within the factory itself in wartime. After the war, the Dalmatinka spinning mill gradually accumulated debts and finally went bankrupt in 2001. In 2004, two Italian entrepreneurs privatized the property. They bought it and they tried to uh, relaunch production. They were supposed to, but instead they speculated on the remaining stocks and avoided paying the workers for months until the bankruptcy was finally um, finalized in 2008. The history and legacy of Dalmatinka has been researched in depth by cultural activists Nikola Krijanac, Dragana Modric, Jelena Pavli Nusic, and Silvia Milic. Besides collecting archive material, personal photographs, and oral history interviews, the group also produced a short documentary with former Dalmatinka workers titled uh, What Did Our Dalmatinka, uh, sorry, the, the documentary is something else. And then they did also an exhibition called What Did Our Dalmatinka Gave to Us, Steinama National Dalmatinka Dala, on the history of the factory. Countering social amnesia about the socialist period, the project addressed the housing condition, community building, solidarity, and women's position in society, especially this uh, that the factory had for such a rural um, community. Together with activists linked to the project, I collected testimonies such as the one of Natasha, who stated that Matinka was the mother of all the inhabitants of the city of Sin and of its surroundings. She fed us, our children, our grandchildren, and we had a future. However, the work came and things did not stay like that. While we worked, there was welfare for all, possibilities, good wages, houses were built, and the future of our children was built. Now the factory is so abandoned, so pillaged, so destroyed, that it is terrible and ugly to tell our children and grandchildren that we once worked there. So there is a destruction also of this memory of dignified work at a certain level. When I visited seeing the factory was abandoned and in disrepair, that was 2016, and lately, the factory was demolished, part of it at least to build a wedding hall in its place. Young generations renewed interest in workers' lives in the socialist and post-socialist era is connected to recent social mobilizations, as well as to young people's daily experience of unemployment and precariousness. The exploration of workers' existence in capitalist time is part of a wider interrogation of the meaning of life and labor in the post-industrial and post-fordist era. Also, the dignity of industrial labor is being reaffirmed, and so is the sacrifice of the thousands of textile workers who engaged in industrial labor in the past decades, as well as the fundamental role played by industrial sites in the modernization of gender relations and in the affirmation of women as equal citizens. And this, this is very important, this idea that women were equal and that the, the, you know, the, their, their role as workers were equal. And that's something that's kind of got lost in, in the transition, this devaluation of workers. Like of female workers was really part of this retraditionalization of gender relations. Um, such issues were hinted at um, by, so this is the Dalmatinka exhibition, it was very successful. And so um, these issues were hinted at already uh, in 2000 by Sanya Vekovic in another Dimish project. In 2000, feminist artist Sanya Vekovic carried out one of her pioneering urban interventions on the facade of the building of the former Nada Dimic textile factory in Zagreb. The factory, named after a young anti-fascist heroine killed during World War II, employed up to 1,700 women during socialism. And when Ivekovic illuminated the factory name in red neon across the facade, the company has gone bankrupt already for some years. The building, an example of industrial architecture from the uh, beginning of the 20th century, had been abandoned for several years as well. The artists organized free legal advice in that process for the faculty, factory female workers who had lost their job. And the art project pointed to the multiple layers of memories that have been lost since transition, namely the memory of women's work, but also the memory of women's anti-fascist struggle. So this heroine, Nanda Dimich, who uh, fought the Nazis. To conclude, the industrial heritage of textile factory in Croatia and more generally in the post-Yugoslav space is very much alive and it is being transmitted across generations to these days. The regeneration of industrial sites associated with textile production would have to take into account the lived experiences and the industrial structure of feeling of current and former textile workers and the entanglement between the industrialization, devaluation of female labor and economic and social injustice, as well as workers' dignity, pride and resilience in post-socialist times. Right. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Chiara. Um, 
what I also wanted to say uh, to all of our uh, participants is that uh, if, if there's a comment, a question, you are also open to uh, write something in our chat if you want, especially because uh, Chiara cannot join us in the sharing console later. So maybe if there's something that you wanted to comment, you can you can do it freely there in the chat. Uh, while yes, we, I'll be happy to it. reply on the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Chiara. Uh, I think uh, with um, uh, our next speaker, Maya Getzic, uh, we will have um, uh, like a very good um, continuation of this topic, but maybe we are coming more towards, um, let's say, um, artistic practice and to see something that Chiara has already shown, but I think uh, Maya will speak uh, through her own practice. How can we tackle this um, local textile histories? How can um, there be this space for participatory voices with the former workers? So Maya, I hope you're here with us. Uh, I'm inviting you to take over. Thank you, Leah. Yes, I am. Do you mind if I don't show myself and the video because I I have issues with presenting myself at the video, but I will share my screen. Is that okay? Yeah, I think it's fine. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, wait, just uh, uh, let's see if I manage to enter full screen. Uh, just a second. Hopefully it will, ah, camera, photos. In case it's complicated, I could also share, I have your PowerPoint, so I could also can, share. Can I, can I then, uh, uh, that's the thing, can I just then do the slides or will you then, because. I will I, do it, I have to do it. If I share it, then I have to share, ch change the slides. You can uh, give me a hint on how you want me to do it or you can try once again. So I think you should just wait, wait. press the green uh, share screen button. Yeah, that I did, but just it shows me a desktop and then open. When you screen. click on that, you have to click another, you have to make another click. Uh, I did, just mm -hmm. a second, because this, this is a new laptop, basically, mm -hmm. that's the maybe problem. Just a second, privacy, why doesn't it give me, aha, uh -huh, desktop, let's see. Uh, if I knew that this could be complicated. Mm, whiteboard. Let me maybe I manage. Uh, preview, share. Jesus. Okay. File. Enter full screen, and then I can't show it. Basically. Well. Okay. Then maybe. I'm sorry. Now this will be. Okay. No worries. I will do it through my computer, and uh, you can give me just yes. a hint when you want me to change the slide. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. Well, um, I'll just put it on. Um, yeah, it's good. So the, this first slide, I wanted to introduce myself. Um, I was uh, born in Belgrade in 1974. Um, and I'm one of the this middle, how would I say the last generations that 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 actually sense this former Yugoslav um, surroundings and also with the textile industry, maybe the last bits and pieces in some sense. But I thought it was important to say that I, grad I finished the School of Design, high school, textile design in 92, and then Faculty of Applied Arts in Belgrade, the textile design department in 98. And then I went to uh, do my master's in Finland in 2002, came back in 2009. And uh, since then, I've been a full-time lecturer at the College of uh, Textile Design, Technology and Management that actually grew up from the textile industry earlier to be a lecturer uh, till 2019. And then since 2019, I am this assistant professor at the University or actually Faculty of Applied Arts in Belgrade. I live and work in Belgrade. So, um, and then the point is to, that um, this background did shape my interest and uh, into study case of Belgrade Woolen Combined that I've been dealing with since uh, almost now 10 years now. 
and uh, the different projects and the uh, uh, Belgrade Woolen Combined project shaped my latest latest artistic practice into among other community based workshops, whether with the clothing identity theme or more intense uh, branding with local wool on t shirts workshops, firstly in Serbia, but abroad as well. And generally, my interest in the past decades since returning to Serbia from Finland after seven years has been around former Yugoslavia remnants, such as the Belgrade Wool and Combined Monumental Legacy, that how I called it initially, or non-aligned souvenirs um, as uh, pointing out, questioning, as well as a base for artistic and, and design production of my own. And then um, uh, the, the next slide, I will now also... Uh, is what what I basically when I came before I left uh, a country to to study to Finland uh, this this industry as, as Chara was also pointing out was there were leftovers in in uh, different ways but uh, by the time I came back to Serbia uh, it felt like there was a as a basic atomic bomb because everything was not, none of it, it existed it was just abandoned buildings mostly uh, even the transition wasn't working but it was really gone completely and the Belgrade woolen combined partly with the the my my uh, interest was uh, it's a part of my neighborhood that is where I grew up in Belgrade it's a uh, um, also like uh, industrial zone of Belgrade with with not only Belgrade wool combined also there is a uh, cotton combine, uh, there is a uh, metal uh, industry quite strong. So it's an industrial area, but also I was working with wool quite a lot. Um, what, what also draw my attention was that the, the that wool was thrown away and then as an asset, like um, being basically scattered around. And this factory was particular in that sense that um, it what what I wrote here, the factory named Belgrade Woolen Combine has been officially in use since 1962, since the integration of several private factories into the state owned company. And among other things, the combine covered a variety of operations, such as processing domestic and important wool into yarns, weaving woolen fabrics, and production of clothes, as well as cooperated with most fashion companies in former Yugoslavia and abroad. And it continued working during the 90s. However, in, 19, in 2006, this textile giant was restructurized. Most of the premises of Belgrade Wool and Combine have been rented out to smaller private companies. The textile complex was finally sold at the auction in 2007 to the company Luka Beograd. And since then, the name, this is bizarre, the, the acronym remained this Belgrade Wool and Combine, but it became uh, BWC Construction Belgrade. And according to the Luca Belgrade financial report from December 2015, this, this BWC Construction Belgrade company employs on average four workers. So this is my, how would I say, platform for the work that I did. Um, and in um, the next slide, Thank you, Leah. Uh, this is this is the 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 my starting point was I started with the architecture. That was the most obvious, the buildings, the abandoned buildings. Uh, also, what was interesting is that that, that I discovered that the the, the weaving and the sp spinning mill of this uh, Belgrade woolen combine were under the protection of the of the cultural monuments um, uh, tutelage. And basically nobody could touch it even if it was sold out. These buildings had to remain the way they are. They were important in different ways and levels and architecturally. So that was another thing. And at the time I was there, it was still not completely sold out. There. So the, these, these um, premises were rented out to the smaller uh, companies. Um, so it's been used like that. The, the one thing that was for me problematic that I couldn't approach and take photos like documented in that sense because I wasn't sure what I want to do with it as an artist because that, that is the way how I function and it was an interesting theme in general. So uh, what happened is that in this slide is like the day advised me that if I want to take photos of the buildings, not to even enter inside, I had to get an approval from, from the CEO uh, officially so that I could actually go and take photos, few photos of this Vinnie weaving and spinning mill. So I did that. It was a very slow process, uh, very 
uh, how would I say annoying. So what happened is that I got approval and this is the actually the paper that says that I could go and take photos and but I need to have someone next to me from the security uh, to see what I'm actually photographing. So I did that and then after this whole process at the end they, the, they, the, the CEO or the director replied that I have to ten, send them photos and then they could either tell me that I can use them or not, even though it was mentioned several times that I want to use them as an artistic uh, material, not like to, to put them in, um, in a papers or to in different media. So basically the, the last reply I never got, and that was quite annoying in some sense. On the other hand, while I was thinking, what else do I have of this material remnants basically of this production was the, the cloth. Um, and the interesting part about the clothing, the woolen clothing that they all also did because they were collaborating with, with the fashion labels all around the country was that you couldn't find them on the flea markets or you couldn't find them in secondhand shops. What I discovered that I could find them mostly at the neighbors and the people's houses. They were kept there unless they were thrown away, but mostly people did keep them. And that was interesting that at one point, then I decided, okay, I'm gonna to try to collect them as a, as a material culture that's left over and then see what I could do with them. And the first thing that did come out, out of this process of trying to document uh, actually the, the building, Lea, next slide, please, sorry. Um, is that this image of the weaving and, and spinning mill, just um, I transferred them and transposed them to these three uh, vintage woolen suits from the fashion labels. And in that sense, no one could say anything, but I marked them. And then the, the image of, of what's left over of that building, which is in a pretty bad condition, you can even see it in this screen print, was, was it, it remained um, and then exhibited more than several times in, in, in various occasions, basically. Um, and also it was important that it's in the screen print because as a part of, again, this kind of uh, production, industrial production. So um, it was important what, where and how. And in that sense, this is the beginning actually in 2014 of this artistic production that I did while gathering still forensically the material about and documenting about the Belgrade woolen combine. So um, in, the next, uh, in the next slide, you can see the other project that I did in 2016, uh, which is basically, it referenced the, the way that I was collecting those suits. It wasn't easy to find them even today, but when people know, they start um, bringing it. And it was mostly that they would give their clothes um, because they know that it was related to an artwork that was important. So uh, in this project, I actually, um, asked the, the donators, so I picked these 10 suits and I asked the donators to write, it's a kind of an in, written interview, uh, they could write in any form they would want to, uh, why they kept it, uh, where they bought it, where they use it, etc. cetera. So they, they, each person would write in their own and the title for this work actually for sentimental reasons is, is on this right corner embroidered into the suit uh, of my neighbor who was actually working for the airline yacht at the time, Yugoslavian airline company. And this is his suit that he was as, um, as a pilot uh, using. So, it, it, and it became um, assembly on its own, uh, a very, how would I say, powerful for me, a kind of a book, booklet out of these suits. What came out of this, was uh, uh, um, workshops that I did even outside of, of the country based on br uh, branding uh, clothing through personal stories or asking the, the, the questioning the identity um, in the sense of clothing and labeling and et cetera. And it, it's quite interesting um, topic in general for me as an artist and as in a collective um, um, work within uh, a certain group of people because while um, embroidering even in these workshops the people were, were embroidering their own clothes uh, it became interesting just um, is, um, to talk about certain issues regarding the the the, the former textile industry not just in Serbia or Yugoslavia but even further in, in Europe in this sense 
So um, the, the, in the next slide, I will jump to, I, because there are different aspects. So I thought I would just give the, the main, uh, the, uh, remain on the road of this topic, is the cooperation that I had with CIMO in 2019. And I thank Tula and, and Tonchi for inviting me, because this um, image is exactly from Zagreb, from the Baza Gallery. And um, uh, when we discuss this, because this 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 project, this art uh, uh, art practice that I did, basically, it it wasn't evolving in the atelier, but rather while communicating, collaborating with different people, also and placing these uh, these material they have in different contexts. So in this sense. As, um, as we discussed and, and Tonchi named it as like situation of absence, it, it was a great reference in a way that placing this kind of a ball of yarn, symbolically, it started as a ball of yarn um, of this clothes that was collected in a small room where it, then it became even bigger and stronger. And the smell, I remember Leah's reaction when, it came to the, when she came to the room, the smell of the clothes. It's, it's, it's like, it, it reminiscence the, the, the people, the workers, the, or everybody involved in the production, but also using this clothes. And at the same time, it, it, it really had a strong impression of this absence. Um, and also, so in that sense, that was a, um, a new addition for my work. And this is how this work evolves. There is no pressure. There are no deadlines. It just slowly starts going one or the other direction. So in that sense, we'll go back to this. But uh, like the, in the next slide, you, you will see the, the latest, uh, how to say, predict artistic production that, that basically I used in uh, the beginning of this year, one of those vintage clothes. Um, and uh, the, the title of this work is mimicry, uh, is like mimicking, uh, stuffing it with, with, the, with this January, with the snow and placing and positioning it in different positions in front of the uh, for, uh, uh, Museum of Yugoslavia, uh, in Bel which is stated in Belgrade as well. So um, uh, again, I, it, it, uh, you will see at the end of the presentation, it somehow leans onto the the docu documents that I made before and the talks that I had with Simo and this like the referring to this um, absence um, that is basically uh, occupying these these kind of materials that I have the documented the documentation that I have in the form of materials of, of suits and, and woolen clothing. Um, so basically, um, just a second. So that's one perspective, and I'll go back to it at the, the second part of the presentation. And the other one, which was driving me quite a lot uh, as an artist, and it was quite fulfilling, and it still is actually, it's, it's another point where the, the, this work started at, at 2016 as a workshop, as an activity in the gallery. Uh, uh, what's, what was the, the idea was not to put just to um, show to the public those uh, documentation that I have and the artworks that I made, but uh, to actively make them participants into the whole theme. So uh, basically this uh, work uh, made the, the title of the wor workshop or the activity in the gallery. The idea was to, um, to create an atmosphere that belongs to this textile legacy, uh, like a community work in a way, and to have something to um, uh, activity that we could all gather around and talk about and use uh, uh, local non-spoon wool. I go back to the wool and to this um, symbolically to the wool and combine. Also t-shirts, I uh, decided to use a t-shirt as a base, as a kind of um, um, basically um, self prom or promotional uh, clothing and then self-promotional because once you put it on you are promoting something and then I did well it started with the idea of 
uh, made in Belgrade, in, in needle felting, the, the title or the expression made in Belgrade, it started for me with that, with the Belgrade woolen combine, but then by going to Smederevo for two different places, it was, uh, it was supposed to um, engage these people into stabbing basically the t-shirt with the local uh, wool that's been thrown away and making these statements like made in Smederevo or made in Prijed or in Bosnia, wherever this, this exhibition was going or where I could do the, the workshop and also uh, doing it in such a way that it doesn't require learning too much skill. It wasn't about learning a new skill, a craft skill, but rather involving people into doing something and making this statement and actually finally taking your t-shirt with you and walking around with it because that's what happened. And uh, the, the nice part of this is that what, because I continued that it, it happened, it, I realized that basically some people were really reluctant to do what I told them to, to make this, um, to write this statement, but rather they started doing their own creative um, um, pieces. And it was, it was great because it gave me another perspective. And I realized that just by putting the, the, the local uh, material um, on the, on the t-shirt was enough of a statement, which actually was quite interesting also this summer in, in, in Sweden, as I say, this is a local, individual, local, and then global thing that 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 was that is happening. For example, with the with the wool itself, and so so for example, this year we had a workshop in Sweden with the local Swedish wool, Gotland and Udebo, and people were again doing this needle felting, and it was quite interesting to hear their impressions and their experiences and to talk to them. So as a as a means, as a wheel vehicle for communicating, it's a I discovered it's a really good way. That in this slide is also from from an international workshop in Serbia, um, and. Um, uh, uh, it was about it was artistic work uh, international uh, actually uh, colony so there were lots of my colleagues and um, it's a board it's a birthplace of Vukaradic, the the person who actually uh, helped to build the, our uh, Cyrillic and also was collecting lots of folk wisdom so the whole place is filled with this and as a part of the uh, work was I started the needle felting these sayings, these folk wisdoms, and then the other colleagues uh, con started contributing. So basically, this is a collaborative work, and in that sense, this kind of a workshop really work because it just starts uh, making things and also talking about it. So it's uh, I I see it as a very um, a good way of uh, communicating and spreading the the how would I say questioning talking about it and just uh, um, working within that field in that sense, and then. Um, this is the latest one where the, the GIF animation is. I'm basically I'm going back and forth with my work. So this is uh, the latest one that I did, and a GIF animation made, uh, which where I'm uh, needle felting made in Belgrade. So this animation is kind of a surrealist um, way of when you look at it with this wool, and uh, you can see on the on the left side or actually on the right side, this wool is more like a, like a material, raw material, which it is, which can become whatever, and it just stresses the 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 what's been um stabbed into the t-shirt so it's a kind of an interesting perspective for those who hasn't been haven't been thinking about it and let's see where it goes um and then with the next slide we go back to baza to zagreb um what i spoke before about the situation of absence and then the the uh, documentary that i made actually talking with the former four former workers it was then important to become to go back to this uh four workers that remain working at the belgrade woolen combined construction uh, company so um in the in the back you can see in the small screen that's a 30, 38 minutes uh, long uh, documentary of uh, talking with four of them at the same time so it was more kind of a discussion than an interview and these white papers are actually extracts they are sentences uh 
referring or stressing this absence in some sense. They're bits and pieces like the clothes. But on the other hand, they stress the topics that are in the conversation with these people. And uh, so here is the four people that I actually not interviewed, but rather talked to them. So um, each of them uh, was... Um, um, so Raiko Kurnata is the first one. He was the head of production. So we, uh, the Kosana was a weaver. Uh, Drago was uh, chief mechanics. And then Vinka was uh, the uh, norm worker. So they're from different uh, parts. They were all working at the Belgrade Wool and Combine. And uh, what what I how I structurized this this last part of the the presentation was that that, that this last latest work mimicry combined with the with these uh, more uh, like assemblies that I in, in, interpreted this this talk with them I will read them I decided not to present you the video but rather to read bits and bigger pieces so that you get an idea of, of what was for me still more, most interesting and I still haven't used because there are so many layers basically regarding this uh, and uh, the, the, the whole, as, as Chiara was talking about, there are so many different layers that one could work with, but uh, let's see where this goes to. But in this sense, these, what I extracted now, uh, very nicely leans on this mimicry suit. So I will just slowly read them. So you will have, um, 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 you will get an impression of what, what still will be my, how would I say, um, inspiration for the other work and also regarding the, the textile industry. So Raiko Kurneta, head of production. I came from Zadar, Croatia to Belgrade Wool and Combine. I applied for a textile school, you know, and I had a certain sense for it. Maybe it was not my first choice at the beginning, but I fell in love with textiles. So I decided to go to technical textiles high school in Varaždin, Croatia. I'm going to be well-dressed. I'll be dandy, trendy guy. Those were my childhood fantasies. So those ideas dragged me into the textile. I came to the combine in 1959 as an assistant production manager in charge of the spinning mill for military purposes when I was 23 years old. I went to school to Zagreb and Varaždin and later in Belgrade, I studied at the textile college while working. This woolen combine had a wide range of products, just to note that in the former Yugoslavia, it was the only major producer of interfacing fabrics. It is a great pity that at least small plants were not left so that the new generation could go to practice in the future. So this is Raiko. Vinka, a normative planner. I was born at the Drina Valley, border of Serbia and Bosnia, but I graduated from elementary high school and also working in the textile cotton industry in Kranj, Slovenia. After that, I came to Belgrade and got recruited at the Belgrade Woolen Combine, first as a worker in a mill in three shifts, three or four months after I worked as a recording clerk, as an accountant, and then I transferred to the planning norms department where I worked until retirement. I was hired in 1974 by Remetic, actually my uncle. I was always sorry for the worker. He was paid the least for actually producing the goods and somehow it didn't make sense for me. I was attracted by the idea that textiles will never stop working because you always have to be dressed and there will always be a need for that. That's what I thought. Otherwise, I wanted to go for a kindergarten teacher. And my father says, why would you deal with children when you can go and you can, where you can create something. Drago Ljubkovalic had weaver. I got a job in 1960s. I worked as a weaver first and then skilled worker. Came from Bielo Polje, Montenegro. But I somehow accidentally came to Belgrade. I was in the Bačka district, Vojvodina, Serbia, and there was a bad storm. And I was on the way home, but there was no transportation. And my cousins asked me if, I would like to work and sent me to a man, head of the personnel department and told me what and how to apply. It was hard to become a resident of Belgrade. This was the worst problem, becoming a resident and I've done that and immediately started working. But when I started, I regretted it, but I was ashamed to leave them. Wow, oh my God, oh, that dust, that banging, I regretted it. But little by little, I got used to the atmosphere in the factory and remain there. 
Kosana Todorovic Weaver. I was born near Shabat, Serbia. I finished textile high school in 1961 in Belgrade. I got the job immediately. At the first, at the time, one did not have to wait long for work. Then I came to the company. I worked in the textile factory in three, sometimes four shifts. I lived in a hotel for singles. I was at first working on the old looms, then on the new. And then so for a while I worked on the control. This was my boss pointing at Raiko. So I worked at the loom the whole time till I was retired from 1961 till 1989. I worked as a weaver. Maya, I'm sorry uh, to jump in, but we are a little bit <laughs> coming tight uh, with, with time. So I just wanted to ask you. Um, no, there are these four slides. You, we don't have to read it. They're, they're, these are like more just a um, combination of what they were saying. You will see on the next one. So I'm reading them basically. And that's, uh, you can read them later if you want to. It's more about how like the demography of Belgrade, how it was lived and, um, what was interesting for me from these talks with them. I think we could definitely come back to, to, to your work uh, in the discussion later on. I hope you will stay with us uh, after we are done. Yes. With I'm sorry if I, if I remain too long. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. I, I think it was very relevant to hear some of these voices that you've been uh, collecting. I'm, I was just thinking, because I knew that there was more uh, of the uh, okay. situation coming up. So I thought that, um, we could continue or maybe come back to, to these stories also later. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, so uh, yeah, definitely we will come back to, uh, to um, Maya's work uh, in the discussion. Um, uh, there was one thing that I wanted to uh, also uh, show you uh, before we move to our next speaker. And it's, um, it's a short film uh, by um, young artist Bruno Jakupovic. I mentioned it in the introduction. Uh, it's a film that uh, she um, did with her grandma. So it was another very personal story of how this uh, uh, local um, uh, oral history is being uh, transferred from one generation to another. So uh, she was interviewing her grandma her uh, memories of the work in Nada Dimic. It's actually one of the factories that Chiara also showed uh, in her uh, presentation. Uh, one of the factories uh, localized very central in the city of Zagreb um, and her work uh, in the 90s. So the film uh, is done in Croatian. We didn't manage to do the subtitles. It's a very short film, only four minutes. So my idea was just to show it to you because the film is not only based on the interview, but uh, on different drawings uh, that the grandma did. Uh, she was invited uh, to... Um, she invited the grandma to draw some of the memories instead of um, only recalling them through text. So um, I'll just share uh, my screen now and show you the short film and then we continue with, with our speakers. Second. Um, the sound is also a little bit uh, low, so but anyways, it's in creation, so probably, but anyways, that wouldn't make a difference. Kajle koje smo 
umetali između prsti, to je bilo isto posebno. I to je bio mali proizvod, nisu ljudi htjeli raditi u tom pogonu. Dobili smo kute, borosane i počeli raditi bez puno priče. Bila je dobra žena. Lijepo nas je primila i, i bili smo zadovoljni. I nismo se previše za niš interesirali jer bile smo sve mlade iz škole smo izašle i nije nas to tak. Ali s vremenom smo shvatili da su tu presudne norme s kojima su nas oni vezali za stolac. Kutija za kutijom i za, i, i za svake kutije je sjedila radnica koja je zabilja brzo, strojevi su bili iz Njemačke, ne novi, a očito je bilo da smo se svi žurili da čim više napravimo, jer smo mislili da je to tako najbolje, a u stvari smo sebi radili medveđu uslu, tako zvano, jer smo si sami sebi nabijali normu i onda smo morali sve više i više raditi. <kuh> Iskreno rečeno, nismo nikad bili zadovoljni sa svojom plaćom, jer smo bili na najnižoj plaći u Zagrebu. A druge ove firme, Kamensko, Vartex, a više je bilo tih. Ali oni su imali drugačiju rogu, imali su odijela, imali su veće artikle. I tak. A mi na ovom sitnišu nismo mogli niš napraviti. Nego stisnuti i raditi. Tako mi <laughs> Pa da, da, da. Da. A znali smo ujutro piti kavu. Vidim, ja sam nažalost i tušila. I nisam jedina. Više nas je bilo kada smo tušile. Uvijek smo tražile da, da nam je to ti odmora, u stvari smo onako umorne još pušile i onda smo se i loši osjećali i to je izdatak bio i tako. A šta ćeš? Onda je jedna ženska već imala i djecu. Došla do, a, na prozor. I motorista je bio na cesti i ona veli, pogledaj kakve cice ima. On nije normalno ni nju vidi, mi smo bili na prvom ratu. A on je bio na cesti, a bio je u bojadi sa on i naš radnik. I nije se obazirao. Tako one su... Stavno htjeli da ja dođem k njima im to pomoći, da dobimo svi isti dan plaću A, u kancelarista. I bile su ugodne i, i ja sam s njima imala isto dobar odnos, kak i sa radnicama u Šivaoni i u Krojnici. Brojali smo plaće u koverte. Jer nije bilo, onda je bilo tako. Moja početna plaća je bila 31.000 dinara. A sad ko je prebacio normu, imali je malo i više. Ili bilo je i malo manje, jer ove starije žene nismo mogli tako raditi ko mi mlađi. 
A ne samo da su plaće kasnili, nego te plaće su nam davali u bonovima. I to dva mjeseca smo čekali te bonove za koje ja nisam mogla. Željela sam si kupiti cepter posuđe, ali nisam od dve plaće mogla kupiti taj set posuđa. To vam je bilo četiri komada s poklopcima. Ali ja to nisam mogla i bila sam jako žalosna. A i nama je povukla bolje artikle i mogli smo kupiti za te bonove špecera ili neke glupe proizvode koje su oni čuvali godinama isto koji mi neke u skladištima. I tako sam bila žalosna i čak sam se plakala kad nisam mogla to ostvariti bar za dva mjeseca. Nije pošteno što to govorim, ali je tako bilo. I onda po ljeti. To je bio tako naporan rad grije. Mi smo imali klimu. Bila je neka stara klima i onda su došli neki radnici kaj su nam to sve razbili gore po nečijoj naredbi. A mi smo se rastapali kako je nama bilo vruće. I moja nakon 33,5 godine staža Bez bolovanja, osim kad sam rodila dvoje djece. Onda sam mirovina, prva mi je bila 825 kuna. A sada imam... Od 98. Do sada ima dve i dvijesto kuna mjerovine i zadovoljne. I also hope that maybe uh, there will be time to come back to some of the elements uh, also um, narrated in the film. It's like, yeah, the everyday life, the cost of the pension of uh, of a textile worker, uh, working conditions, safety uh, in the workplace, uh, all narrated in a very informal manner, manner in a sense of like uh, granddaughter and grandmother sitting together. Um, I would like to switch to our um, next uh, speaker. It's uh, Maya Archebić, a curator at the city, Zagreb City Museum. She's actually here uh, with me uh, in Simo Center. Um, I would like her to um, now bring us a little bit uh, closer to uh, workwear. Uh, what does workwear mean within the context of a museum collection? And also her work was also a base for the research that we are doing with um, uh, Tina Gverovic and Ben Kane. So their talk will connect well uh, with, with Maya. So Maya, I'm going to just move the computer a little bit. And I will just share the screen. Uh, Well, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to say something about the workwear in the Zagreb City Museum in our collection uh, of fashion, fashion accessories and uh, textiles. Uh, the Zagreb City Museum collects uh, various types of objects that illustrate the history and daily life of the city. Uh, among others, we collect items of clothing that are unfairly neglected uh, among museums, uh, museum acquisitions for a long time. The intensive inflow of items uh, within the collection of fashion, fashion accessories and textiles during the last two decades has influenced the formation of separate units, one unit of which is workwear. 
uh, workers, coats, workers, overalls, workers, suits, and uh, associated headgear. We started collecting workwear about 15 years ago uh, when the Zagreb Industrial Heritage uh, Project started at the Zagreb City Museum. Uh, then the need to collect this type of clothing as also arose. Uh, these items uh, represent an important segment of Zagreb's history and attitude towards workers. Uh, uh, uniforms worn by uh, brigadiers participating in youth, youth work uh, action were among the first items collected for the coll uh, collection. Uh, the uniforms uh, had uh, badges uh, of work brigade sewn on the sleeves and on the chest uh, were badges that the brigadiers, as was customary, exchanged with each other. Uh, here uh, you can see some photos and documents related to work and workers that can be seen in the museum's permanent uh, exhibition. Uh, workwear is really related to the problem of safety at work. Uh, hygienic and technical protection began to be implemented in the work system in industry after the Second World War. Uh, with intentions uh, to increase safety in the workplace, protective clothing or work clothing became more and more critical. Most of, uh, of the uh, artifacts uh, in our collection date from uh, 1980s. It was a decade when the working safety system was significantly improved compared to the immediate post-war period. Uh, when we are speaking about uh, workwear, uh, we can uh, actually work where we can uh, can be divided into men's and women's. Uh, then we can distinguish work coats, work suits, overalls, footwear, and caps. And we can also distinguish it according to the institutions, companies, crafts, uh, civil services, hotels, and uh, restaurants. Uh, here is one work coat uh, from the Ferrimport store. Uh, this uh, workwear is, all, is also attractive because of the logos of the factories and companies, uh, which are use, usually printed on the chest, usually on the uh, upper left pocket. Printed logos uh, often, often, uh, often help us to date the time of the creation of workwear more precisely. Unfortunately, we rarely find uh, manufacturer labels on these garments. You can see uh, work suit in the tobacco factory Zagreb and overalls in the Kromos uh, factory. Uh, here are uh, Borasana, uh, protective footwear. Uh, Borosana uh, has been on the market since uh, 1968. It was developed by a team of experts led by Dr. Branko Strinovic, an orthopedist from Zagreb. Uh, Borosana was created for women who stand for a long time or work uh, a lot. Uh, here you can see a cap uh, from public transport company called Z. Uh, this cap was worn by a lady who drove a tram in Zagreb in the 70s and 80s. Uh, in the second photography, you can see the manufacturer, uh, lab uh, manufacturer's label. The 22 December factory produced military uniforms and protective uh, clothing. Uh, unfortunately, many factories to which this workwear belong have stopped uh, production, uh, so did Prvomajska and uh, Tos Penkala factory. Uh, here are some photos of the workwear of civil services. Uh, you can see uh, doctors, uh, workwear, nurses, and em employees of the Croatian uh, post office. Also, uh, here is the uh, Hotel Esplanade chef's uh, workwear. Uh, this jacket was collected directly from the owner, actually from the owner's uh, son. Uh, and among these objects, workers' coats dominate, mainly men's, usually blue, sewn from cotton twill. Two-piece work suits have been preserved less uh, often, as the, these suits were also worn outside the factories because the owners used them for work outside working hours. The jackets were most often preserved, while the trousers were probably uh, worn out. 
a worker in Rade Concha factory who worked in transport and who wore this jacket was engaged in amateur photography. And this jacket is kept in his photo lab, actually. Uh, and also, as you can see, his wife mended his pocket with a piece of uh, denim. Uh, the first, as I said, the first examples of workwear that arrived at the Zagreb uh, City Museum were bought at the Hrelic uh, flea market. We like to say that every museum object uh, needs its own person. So since these items were bought at the flea market, the information about the owner uh, has been lost. Uh, <clears throat> uh, this is the last uh, acquisition. Uh, this work coat was bought last week. You can also see uh, the price. It cost about six uh, euros. Uh, this is the work coat of the Concha factory that, uh, Frank factory, sorry, uh, that produced coffee. Uh, during the first conversation with the owner, he insisted that it was an unused uh, new item. Only when I clarified uh, that I was interested in buying this coat for the museum collection and Actually, it was clear from the logo that it was a worker's coat from the beginning of the 80s, that he admit uh, the age of the item. The workers wore uh, these brown wo uh, work coats when cleaning the coffee machines. Uh, usually they wore white coats. In addition to workers' coats, uh, they wore trousers, caps, uh, and footwear called uh, borosana. Uh, they received uh, white work suits every year and brown suits every two years. Uh, the workers who worked in the transport and logistics of the Frank factory wore uh, blue uh, work suits. Uh, these pants were bought also at the Hrelic flea market. They were bought by our colleague Tomci Vladislavic, who wore them as a civilian clothes. A few months ago, he donated these pants to the Zagreb uh, City uh, Museum. Uh, next week, uh, we are opening in the Zagreb City Museum, we are opening an exhibition about uh, Zagreb's firefighters. And among other things, a firefighter's uh, suit, a protective helmet and protective boots will be on display. Two years ago, a strong earthquake uh, happened in Zagreb and we received this protective suit from the Zagreb firefighters, which they, were, uh, they wore during a one uh, difficult uh, in intervention. Uh, also, there are the traces of damage from the explosion uh, on, the, on the suit. Uh, also, uh, the second photo shows uh, firefighters securing uh, one of the roofs after the earthquake. Uh, here uh, you can see a photojournalist's uh, protective helmet. Uh, it was taken, the photo was taken the day after the earthquake, and this photojournalist also gave us his jacket and jeans. Uh, he just kept the bike, but uh, I hope it just for a while. Uh, here is the protective uh, helmet, the green one. Uh, here you can see a uh, so-called uh, combat kit, uh, the, pro uh, the protective helmet of the Zagreb structur structural engineer, Krunoslav Komesar, and the so-called uh, combat kit used by statics when uh, assessing the degree of damage to buildings suffered in Zagreb uh, earthquake. Uh, here is the doctor's uh, protective suit, the protective suit of the doctor uh, of the hospital for uh, infectious disease from the be beginning of the pandemic. With this suit, we'd also have uh, a few types of masks, caps, gloves, uh, and uh, shoes. Uh, workwear uh, was exhibited as part of the exhibition Zagreb's uh, neighborhoods, for example, at the exhibi exhibition Treshnyovka, the neighborhood and the people. In the exhibition section related to the Zagreb factories uh, of this former working class quarter, the workers' coats of the Tex Tesla factory were uh, on display. Uh, museum uh, visitors could see working suits in the photographs of the Industrial Heritage uh, Exhibition. And uh, it is in interesting 
to note that some of the workers in these photos are dressed in workwear and some of them are in civilian clothes. Uh, here are some photos of uh, fashion and clothing uh, exhibition uh, called Fashion and Clothing in Zagreb in the 1960s. Uh, and here uh, on the left side, you can see the worker uh, in the photo on the left side is uh, barefoot. She is wearing a, a workwear, but without shoes. Uh, the next exhibition that will be set up at the Zagreb City Museum is by artists uh, Ben Kane and Tina Gverovic. Uh, and the organizer of this, this exhibition uh, is uh, CIMO, Center for Research uh, of Fashion and Clothing within their BOSA briefing on soft art project. The exhibition uh, will be an opportunity to display workwear from the museum collection among the artists' uh, works. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Maya. Uh, in the uh, screen, uh, thanks a lot for this uh, presentation. I think this is very relevant because somehow uh, this year has been uh, we've been focusing so much on the collaboration with the museum, working with their collection, but also bringing in um, artists. So I'm inviting uh, Ben Kane and Tina Gverovic. Mm -hmm. I think they're here with us uh, to continue uh, this discussion. I mean, through speaking about uh, their their work. Hi. Hey. Um, uh, you you can uh, share the screen and uh, continue. I think there will be a very smooth uh, transition now from Maya's um, okay. talk to, to yours. Super. Can you hear us? Okay. Yep. Fantastic. Okay, so um, we'll introduce ourselves first of all. I'm I'm Ben Kane. I am an artist, and I'm also teaching quite a lot at uh, BA and MA. Um, in London, and I am working across a lot of different media and uh, making clothing, and particularly thinking about workwear is perhaps is is one part of many different things that um, that I'm doing. Tina and I work together very often, but we also have um, uh, separate practices, um, and we will talk about both. The things that we're doing together and to very briefly talk about some things that we've done separately that nevertheless connect to what we're working on with CIMO. So I'm, I'm Tina Gredovic. I'm also an artist and a teacher and I teach also in London and um, perhaps what's interesting to say that I am um, um, my work is multidisciplinary. I work mostly with large scale installations, but with specific interest in history and economy of materials. And therefore there's perhaps interesting crossover with working with um, uh, clothing and, and the history of clothing and fabric and workwear with this upcoming project. So what, we we have planned something that we hope will take um 20 minutes hopefully not more um and we will start with reading something uh it's just reading a a, a text just a sec so we'll start with um with, yeah with with reading something and we'll show a number of slides along alongside that text so we'll read something or i will read something that lasts about 10 minutes and we'll move through a number of different images some of those images are from the museum um, and so some of them will be familiar from the presentation we've just seen some the black and white images are from a a photographer that was Zagreb based uh, photographer called Tosho Dabats. And some of the other images are, well, they're all sort of research images, I suppose. And then we'll move on to um, presenting um, some of the things that Tina's been doing and then some of the things that I've been doing. And then finally, if we have time, we'll speak just for a couple of minutes about the project um, more specifically with Zima. But all the things we're presenting really are sort of. Um, offer a sort of background or introduction to, to what we're working on right now at the museum and with CIMO, really. So what shall I do? Try and share a screen, I suppose. Yes, please, I wanted to remind you not to forget to share the screen. Yeah. 
Okay. Yep, it works. That working okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you should see a woman on the screen measuring something. Yep, yep, that's visible. Fantastic. Okay. So, um, what do we think traditional workwear is? What does it signify? What sorts of activity or subjectivity might we associate with workwear? Perhaps it's the design and the physical quality of the workwear that influences the wearer's understanding of what that workwear means. And it's the design that influences our perception of the wearer. Twill that's a generation or more old, worn and washed hundreds of times, resulting in a second skin that knows your body and how it wants to move. Can we distinguish between workwear that's used for wearing to work and workwear that's worn for leisure? It's probably the difficulty of not being able to distinguish between work and leisure that is what draws us to want to examine workwear as a subject. Good design and good quality fabrics are more comfortable and more enjoyable to wear. Good design helps to make the wearer feel at home in the clothes and in turn to some extent at home in the job because the manager's investment in the clothing, in ergonomics, in fabrics, translates to investment in the worker. Poor design and poor fabrics represent a disregard for the worker or the wearer. And in this is revealed a toxic relationship between workers and those who manage them. When you're wearing workwear, you're announcing something. You're performing the worker. You're representing the employer, the industry you're part of. You're saying that you're at work, in service, that you're essentially being directed by someone or something else that something else might be a machine that demands a specific sequence of bodily moves. Like s and bondage wear, workwear can restrict the body in a way that suggests domination and control. Is it useful to think about mapping the pleasures of bondage and fetish wear onto contemporary workwear? Clothing might discipline the body and if so, we might want to think about whether or not that discipline is welcome. Workwear, perhaps good quality workwear, also carries a dignity with it. And the belonging that the workwear indicates might be a source of pride and solidarity in equality. Do all forms of workwear protect and unify? Does contemporary faux fake workwear workwear that's made for the fashion industry also protect and unify? Does not for work workwear announce the same thing as genuine workwear? It doesn't, but, but it might want to. Workwear offers the wearer temporary authority, anonymity, a mask, the relief of not operating as an independent or solely responsible individual but rather as an objective operative. In contemporary working conditions and everyday life, being able to make meaningful decisions, being powerful can be hard to come by and political agency and financial freedom are scarce. With this in mind, workwear might offer elevation or relief. The dispossessed, does workwear offer belonging? These are a whole series of, of badges that um, would be worn by workers on workwear. And they are images of organizations, of companies, of firms. And again, this is a collection which is in the archive of the, of the museum, uh, City of Zagreb Museum. Interests in workwear stem from thinking about complicated and changing characteristics of contemporary work, 
namely instability and precarity associated with today's jobs or professions. Workwear seems compatible with an identifiable single skill base, and no doubt we most readily associated with heavy industry and the accompanying world of unions, communities and class. Trans transdisciplinarity in what's now called the creative sector or soft sector around 20 to 30 years ago was an exciting space of diverse thinking and moving between a variety of ways of working was exhilarating and importantly it was a choice. It seems now that being actively involved in a broad range of disciplines or practices is an economic imperative and is something that comes with a lack of space for mastery, control, sense of ownership and competence in one's field. And perhaps this generates inferiority and subservience rather than agency and self-worth. The pride in belonging to an organization, being within a collective body of people who might even wear the same clothing and workwear, is now scarce because status and value is associated with entrepreneurs, people who have their own businesses rather than in brackets workers. But freelancers and entrepreneurs have to pedal quite hard, working on their gregarious, infinitely capable worker identity, for whom any visually unifying clothing would be anathema. The contemporary worker is broken can hardly function, is functionless. Some of the clothes presented here are similarly dysfunctional, but while some might present an idea of current work conditions, others might point to future conditions. We were reading about a woman who said that she wears workwear because it allows me to explore a gender-free style while feeling safe. Contemporary faux workwear is all about associating with the positive aspects of what work can do for individuals, community, society. Today's non-workwear is a clean symbol of a non-existent physical relationship with work, pointing to a desire for the body to impact the world, for hands to touch materials, to shape things. It's a sign of community and amidst a dearth of quotidian craft related, not artisan, which is quite different, production in the workplace. It's an emblem of need and nostalgia. It's anti-capitalist and this is paradoxical. It's inevitably, inevitably about class war, desiring commonality, equality, but people also wear faux workwear because they don't want to make creative decisions about which clothes to wear. Today's fashion workwear that has nothing to do with work is often dull, mundane, characterless, which in itself is a statement. The wearer wants to express a refusal of radical individualism and a market that's saturated with choice. Do they want to say, I align with the working class, or at least with worker solidarity, unions and the left, doubtful. But few people wear workwear to work anymore, and the definition of the working class is no longer aligned with the sorts of industry that require workwear, or at least certainly not the type that's found in high street and high end fashion stores. It's romantic, honesty, safety, trust. The pieces that combine traditional workwear with abstract shapes, such as large square oblong sheets, refer to the idea of workplaces that demand ultra flexible workers, able to fit into any format instantly, to morph, to be chameleon, to be super adaptive. Today's job market, market can be quite opaque. What do people actually do to make money? There are few clearly defined roles now. In work where colour is all about categorization, departments, positions, hierarchies, clearly defined roles, the indigo dye of blue workwear jackets sought to mask the dirt and grease that would result from the work environment. This was especially important when the frequent washing of clothing was not possible or extremely labour intensive. 
workwear is attractive because it's about identity and livelihoods, because it contains complex ideas about our changing idea of what work is, because it's inevitably about class, because it expresses a desire to work differently and to imagine a different societal structure that's focused on communality, egalitarianism and the worker's agency. Because it performs non-spectacular consumption, because it allows us to think about how we work now, how we worked previously and how we might work in the future. And the question of how we work is the question of how we live and how we relate to others. The questions about workwear are questions about exploitation, overproduction, toxic progress, all sorts of injustice, because workwear is a space of protection, care for bodies and care for workers, because workwear is about conditioning the body as well as care. It's about oppression and constriction, wage bondage and SM bondage are close. This is a hat which is not made by us, it's made by an organization in London called IDEA. So we are finishing there with just that first bit of reading and some images associated. And now we're gonna move on to um, Tina, who is gonna show a series of slides just around five or six or something like that. Life of a thread or being woven into a form. Fabric was manually dyed and re-dyed to create a distorted effect, a double layer, a shattered form, then packed, then shop, shipped, then sold in small quantities. A move towards better labor protection also comes as the attitudes of many younger generations have changed. Unlike their parents who believed that hard work pays off, there has been a growing sense of dis dissatisfaction among exhausted youth who see a little reward in doing the same. Some are so disillusioned that the lie flat has gained traction in recent months, referring to the idea that people should not overwork and instead be content with more attainable achievements. So, as it folded into a sleep, she continued with the motions of threading the needle, pushing it evenly through the soft weaves of the fabric. Loop after loop, the waves of the fabric enclosing into a shape form. No more cutout pieces with sharp edges, only smooth lines. Frame was needed to keep it all in place. Drift, no longer sustainable, interconnected, tied, woven through the netting, holding each other, together in one place. Bodies of fabric, or bodiless fabric, or fabric longing for bodies. So I um, I'm just going to show now a couple of um, a couple of slides from a couple of related projects. This is um, it's housed in a museum. And, um, yeah, it's a museum of um, what's it called? It's called the Technical Museum Museum Nikola Tesla Museum. So they house a lot of um, old engines and machines and. Um, yeah, all sorts of sort of signs of uh, heavy industry from another era. But the, the site where this particular work is um, situated, it's here. It's in a large sort of hall space that was a factory. Um, and then later, later on, it was, I believe, um, 
they had a few different incarnations. It was a squat at some point, this space, and it was also a supermarket. Um, and then it later became a museum. So it's one of those sort of sites like many contemporary art sites that sort of moved through this process of, um, you know, from, from heavy industry to creative industry. And that, that backdrop, that sort of context was important for this work. It's a series of pieces of clothing that were found. They're all sort of from the 70s and 80s that were, that were never worn. And they are spliced with a number of different um, large sheets of fabric, cotton fabric, different colors. So they're just sort of mostly cut in half. Um, and then spliced together with, with bits of fabric. Some of them, some of these pieces you saw in the slides that we showed initially, worn by um, a woman called Mary Churich. Um, so it's on a it's on a specially made frame, a um, powder coated frame, and it was housed in the in the middle of this uh, in this factory in Zagreb, X Factory now museum. This is um, a piece of work that I made very recently, maybe a week or two ago. So the piece before in Zagreb was maybe a couple of years ago. This is just a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's made, uh, the, all of the pieces are made by a clothing company based in Čačak in Serbia. So it's this um, piece was part of an exhibition, a Biennale that took place in Čačak. It's called um, Nadezhda Petrovic um, Biennale. Um, so I asked the, the company to make a number of different workwear pieces, but asked them to make whole pieces, but also to, to give just an, all the sort of separate parts that would make up a, uh, a single piece of classic sort of workwear coat. And then all of those pieces are, um, are displayed in different ways on this metal and concrete, uh, these metal and concrete structures. Um, so there, it's all using X uh, pieces of fabric that Tina or I have used before in other work and we re have recycled it and, and dyed it, colored it. So it's all anyway dead stock and old material. Um, there are also a number of clay pieces that you can just about see on them. Um, ceramics pieces that are um, like collars, like blue collars. Um, like many other towns, this there was it right in the very center of the town. There are a lot of enormous factories. Um, and they really um, mark the identity of the, of the town, I suppose, but not surprisingly, all of those factories are now defunct. So in, in ethnographic museums around the world, of course, in Chachak as well, we see these small armies of ancient bodies poised on top of thin metal rods, which are sunk into weighted bases. This method of display is also employed in this installation. Although in this case, beneath a fairy tale canopy of Ficus Elastica Decora. The fragments of blue fabric and ceramic displayed on the concrete and steel mannequins might be remnants from another time, possibly recalling nostalgic notions of labor and associated solidarity, but equally they might be records of contemporary experiences of work, distressed, disassembled, dismantled, and marked by chameleon and multifaceted identities. This is Mary, again, the same model as in some of the images from before. And Mary is here standing in a factory on the outskirts of Zagreb. It's um, a factory that produced paint. And it's, I don't know exactly when, but I think in the late eighties, it was already no longer functioning. And the, the entire factory, several floors, is, as you can see, falling to pieces. And it's covered with pigment. The entire factory has, uh, there's different, different colors on different levels and in different spaces of the factory. And I made um, a number of different work coats specifically for this um, photo shoot and for that environment. 
And uh, I'm sorry mm -hmm. to interrupt you, uh, but uh, we are running out of time for this um, uh, official part, uh, which should be done uh, by noon, and we will continue um, uh, like more informally for the next one hour. We have this space to discuss, so I think um, we could uh, just because there's some formalities about stopping the recording at this point, but we continue with the discussion. So I think we could keep uh, the images going just so we kind of let the people know that maybe we will have like a more informal part. Um, Erika, are you around here somewhere listening? Uh, just so uh, we just um, maybe we want to stop the recording and then just continue informally. But I would still like for Ben and Tina to maybe continue discussing, especially because now they would maybe show a little bit about the project uh, also that is going to happen in Zagreb, but we can continue regardless of this formal part of the format. Mm, thank you. Oh, absolutely, Leah. Thank you so much. I'd like to just thank all your um, presentations and all your speakers and just sharing so um, provocatively and so um, with such a, a deep impact on on um, a particular kind of um, really deep reading and research into the space. So thank you very, very much. And um, with that, um, the end of the first session on, on um, day one. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, I think, yeah, we, we brought in a lot of material. Uh, we were trying to kind of uh, synthesize what to, what to show. 